I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank good you. and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Matt Bernico. I'm your other co-host, Dean Detloff. Folks, welcome to the second episode in our series on Cuba. If you didn't hear our episode last week, then you should go back and listen to it. But it's also not essential to understand what we're going to do here. So don't don't pause your podcast now to go back to just just wait. It'll be fine. You can listen to it after. You're in the right it'll be, place. It'll be great. You're in the right place. That's right. So here's the big idea in case you haven't listened last week. Advent is a time that we talk about peace, hope, joy, and love. But how can we really do any of that when the U.S. continues to carry out an illegal and also very dumb blockade against Cuba? So we are dedicating this Advent season to unpacking some of the relationship between Cuba and the U.S. and also urging people to find a way to build solidarity and speak out against the blockade. Uh, You can write to your reps, tell them what you think. Also consider getting involved with, you know, Pastors for Peace or any other kind of solidarity organization. Um, It's worth it. It's worth your time to do, I think, personally speaking. (laughs) Um, also, if you haven't already, you can kind of uh, wade into those waters um, by checking out our new Cubazine. You can get it if you go to bit.ly slash Cubazine, and uh, you can read all about Christianity in Cuba. It's a really cool thing, and I think it's worth reading, not just because I helped make it, but also because um, it's an important piece of the puzzle in like, kind of telling an alternative story about Cuba. Uh, the United States, uh, as you may have you may know, <laughs> has uh, kind of ha- held the reins of a media narrative about Cuba for a very long time, and it's bad and dumb. So learn something new. Yeah, especially when it comes to religion and Christianity. If you listen to the show at all, ever before, you'll know that Christianity is a tried and true anti-communist kind of weapon. And if you're a Christian on the left, uh, I don't know, I find that very annoying. I don't like it at all. So it's good to highlight some uh, Christians who are trying to show that that is maybe not the case, that there's not a natural opposition between Christianity and uh, socialism, these kind of alternative economic systems. And that's what we're trying to do in this zine, and it's what we're going to do in this episode as well. Uh, Last week, we spent some time talking about a really weird report from the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. What a commission that I didn't know existed (laughs) until we found it. (laughs) Uh, And uh, the report extrapolates some bizarre religious propaganda pushed by the United States. Um, It's very funny. I don't know if people have read it since we did the episode. It's interesting to read. It claims that uh, all religious people who are in support of the revolution are actually fake religious people. And it bases that on a highly limited self-selecting e-survey of a handful of evangelical Christians uh, in Cuba for the most part. But it's actually not the only propaganda campaign that the U.S. has launched against Cuba, if you could guess. (laughs) Uh, In fact, in this episode, we've done a a Magnificast BuzzFeed listicle. We're going to talk about uh, some of the the top five wildest things that the U.S. has done or said about Cuba. We're going to focus on some of the big ones, some of the maybe more recent ones that you may or may not have heard of. There is so much that you could talk about, I think, when it comes to this topic. If you know anything about Cuba, you've probably heard of the Bay of Pigs. But guess what? The United States didn't stop doing increasingly violent military campaigns against Cuba after that. It has done all kinds of very weird, almost like cartoonishly bizarre plots to assassinate Fidel Castro and uh, create unrest and all kinds of stuff. Man, if you uh, if you want to hear another great podcast (laughs) and you must because you're listening to this great podcast, uh, 
you can check out season two of Blowback, which is all about ways that the U.S. has messed up in Cuba and tried to destroy it and failed to do so. Um, all interesting stuff. But on the Magnificast, we did pull out some particular weird Christian kind of angles, and we're going to try to tie it into what we talked about last week. Uh, Matt, am I miss th- missing anything else in the setup here before we uh, start moving down our big top five? No, that's it. Um, let's do it. Let's let's go to the list. <laughs> All right. It feels so gross to be uh, like this is a list of the five wildest things that the U.S. has done because some of them are extremely grim. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you don't have some kind of levity about it, I guess it would be too much to bear in my brain. Yeah. You know, Fidel had a levity about it, so I feel like we can lean into that. Um, All right. Good. So we're going to start with a soft one, though. And I think this is a good way to kind of get an on ramp here. And this is a very mild one. Matt and I have been reading about Cuba for a while now. And uh, not too long ago, maybe last year, even we both got this book that we're reading together called Manufacturing the Enemy, the Media War Against Cuba by a guy named Keith Bolander, who's a Canadian journalist who wrote for the Toronto Star for a long time. And it is a kind of media analysis of Cuba, but also pulls out some different uh, schemes <laughs> that uh, the U.S. has done. And he is an interesting journalist uh, just trying to pull out, you know, I don't know, the, the things that go by in the headlines, but you don't keep track of this guy's keeping track of them. So we last week talked about the links between this Wild Commission on Religious Freedom and USAID, that there's some kind of connection there, right? Uh, USAID, for people who've never heard of it, is basically a big U.S. government-sponsored, they say, development agency. Um, In fact, it's a kind of like soft power agency. So at a certain point, the U.S. started to understand that if you just like do something like the Vietnam War, people will stop liking you. Um, (laughs) And so they decided to get sneakier about it. So now they try to destabilize different social projects through other means, right? Like, uh, well, we'll talk about a few of them, but (laughs) lots of very weird things that they do. Uh, It's a big propaganda machine is what it comes down to. So the first one on our list is a a very kind of weird, uh, weird USAID campaign. And it comes out of this book by Keith Bolander, Manufacturing the Enemy. So let me tell the story, Matt, and then we can uh, maybe break it down a little bit. Yeah. So in 2009, a guy named Alan Gross, who's a contractor with USAID, he was not like a regular state employee. They hired him on. They paid him like six hundred thousand dollars. He got hired to make five trips to Cuba that year. And USAID said that he was bringing communication equipment to provide Internet connectivity to the Jewish community in Havana, which is a small community in Havana. And according to Keith Bolander, actually leaders in that Jewish community had said they already had Internet access. And in fact, they had like a pretty good relationship with the government and they felt that they had their their needs met. In fact, the government supplied like laptops and cell phones to them. But uh, Bolander writes that USAID claimed that Gross was simply carrying low level communication equipment similar to cell phones. So that's the official story. He's just sort of on a, a U.S. mission to increase connectivity. What he actually what a nice had, guy. Yeah, nice guy. <laughs> what he actually had, according to Bolander, was an illegal high-tech broadband global area network system designed to create untraceable satellite communication networks, equipment prohibited not only in Cuba, but in any country in the world. Once set up, the signal is independent from any regulatory oversight, the small size and big capabilities to potentially connect directly with anti-government organizations or terrorist groups places uh, these kinds of area networks as a device most authorities want under their control and knowledge. So uh, this is what he's actually installing, right? And if you know anything about uh, Cuba-U.S. relations, you'll also know that fears of terrorism <laughs> are not misplaced, unfortunately. Uh, so that's the the kind of, you know, the ostensible reason is coming to empower this Jewish community. The real reason is to set up this very weird infrastructure. So, uh Alan Gross, he gets arrested by the Cuban government and he's declared a spy and he is sentenced to 15 years in prison. And Alan Gross said that he actually had no idea really about the long history between Cuba and the U.S., something that's kind of hard to believe, but we'll talk more about that. And he said that he didn't know that what he was doing was illegal. 
But during 2009, it turns out that he did speak with his supervisors and told them he felt like he was playing with fire and that the detection of satellite signals will be catastrophic. So he did go to prison and he was there for five years. And then when Obama initiated this thaw in relations between the U.S. and Cuba, uh, Gross was released as part of that kind of negotiation. Uh, So here's where things get kind of wild. So this guy, Alan Gross, (laughs) um, you know, you might think of him as like a wild James Bond, a tech James Bond. He's going down to Cuba. He's setting up the BGANs, this big (laughs) global area network. (laughs) Um, and, uh, you know, and then he got caught and what a bummer for him. But in fact, uh, when I think he says that he is ignorant about Cuba U S history or that what he's doing is illegal, there's actually some reason to believe that that's true. And Bolander doesn't say that outright, but kind of gestures toward it in his book. Uh, because in fact, when Alan Gross got back to the U S after five years in prison, he sued us aid saying that they misled him about what he was actually doing. And in fact, he reached a settlement for like over two million, two million dollars. And Washington, Bolander says, refused to admit that Gross was anything other than a private citizen arrested for carrying in legal communication equipment. So (laughs) this is the first story that we're kind of starting off with. And I think it's a good on ramp because there are so many wild things (laughs) about this event. Um, And man, poor Alan Gross. uh, What a huge bummer to be a guy who's just a contractor getting a a trip to Cuba uh, only to turn out to be in prison for five years. Yeah. It is such a funny picture, though, for this guy just to not know what's going on or not really know the antagonisms between these two countries and just be like, well, I guess I'm going to go install this weird computer. Yeah. (laughs) No problem there. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking. And I think it's also interesting because, uh, as I said, and we'll talk about some of the stronger examples of U.S. meddling in a minute here. But in the past, the U.S. had no qualms about pretty openly invading Cuba in the case of the Bay of Pigs and also supporting violent actions against Cuba with all kinds of paramilitaries and exile groups. And over time, this kind of soft power idea went out, right? The U.S. is like, we'll do it through these other means. But what's kind of fascinating about this example is they sort of hired Alan Gross as kind of a useful idiot, right? <laughs> like, he's one step removed. He's a contractor with USAID. So they've gotten to a point where U.S. imperialism is even like, conscripting the entrepreneurs (laughs) unwittingly into uh, regime change, which I think is pretty wild. The the key to sort of take away from this one, and a thread that I want to pull till we get to the very end, is that the U.S. is finding increasingly creative and weird ways to uh, meddle with Cuba. And remember Alan Gross and this USAID story, story, because it will come back up in a structural way when we talk about... uh, (laughs) the U.S. trying to set up a, a fake Twitter, and then later when we talk about the U.S. and evangelicals. So we're, we're opening it up with an on-ramp, and we're going to come back to those themes. That's right. Okay. So if that's an example of soft power, let me give you an example of <laughs> less soft power. <laughs> medium power. Uh, probably ha- medium power. I would say hard power in some ways. Okay. Um, so from 1960 to 1962, the CIA... Um, in collaboration with the Catholic Church, <laughs> yikes, <laughs> carried out uh, what's called Operation Peter Pan or Operation Pedro Pan, depending on who you're talking to. Um, Operation Peter Pan was a clandestine operation uh, that the CIA was behind, again, with the Catholic Church. Um, that um, it, it lasted from 1960 to 1962, but possibly lasted until 1981, depending on kind of like who you're talking to. Uh, that funneled somewhere between 14,000 and 25,000 kids from Cuba to the United States. Yikes. Uh, It's very bad. So specifically, the operation spread rumors that claimed that Fidel Castro was planning on terminating the rights of parents in Cuba. Um, He wasn't, but that didn't matter to anybody in the United States. Um, and, uh, and when he terminated those rights, he was going to transfer the, the parent, the parental rights to the state so that, um, you know, they could indoctrinate the kids at the communist summer camp. Um, that was a big idea, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the, um, the CIA circulated these rumors in two ways, primarily first and foremost, just through like, um, a fabricated document that got passed around through churches, uh, like church pews, like 
li- literally through churches that was um, just explained like what was happening. That there's like this um, piece of legislation where the uh, their parental rights were going to be, um, you know, cut off. And then the other place that this uh, rumor was being spread was from Radio Swan. Um, if you don't know anything about Radio Swan, it is a pirate radio station, a black station, if you will, set up in Honduras on the Swan Islands to uh, broadcast uh, fake news and disinformation into Cuba. So among that fake news and disinformation, um, disguised as real information, um, you know, but if you're a person with a radio, it's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> uh, anyways, that, that kind of spread the story as well, right? Um, so the CIA used the Catholic clergy, uh, Father Brian o. Walsh, who was in the United States in Miami, and James Baker, who was the headmaster of a Catholic school in Cuba, to spread the rumor that Catholics uh, to, to spread this rumor to Catholics in Cuba and to kind of like further the reach of this rumor and kind of give it some credence, right? Um, so all these parties are kind of mixing together and and working together to kind of set up this pipeline um, that would. I mean, for lack of a better word, I mean, no, not like this is the right word that would traffic children from mm-hmm. Cuba to the United States. Like that's what it is, right? They uh, parents were tricked into sending their kids to the United States through the Catholic Church. So, like I said, um, the 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 main thrust of the program was from from 1960 to 1962, where 14,000 kids were kind of pushed through this. Um, it stopped in 1962, or uh, it stopped in some ways in 1962 because that was when the 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 Cuban Missile Crisis happened and. Um, Sort of like a you know a moment where things had to quit, uh, things had to stop for a second. But um, some people speculate that it lasts up until 1981, and even more kids went through it. So somewhere between 14,000 and 25,000, I guess is probably the real number, maybe more. Hard to say. If it makes you feel better, the the bourgeois press, the New York Times, in an obituary of one Catholic priest, Brian O'Walsh, that you mentioned, they say that it was a uh, 14,000 between 1960 and 1962. So the capitalists. <laughs> Also have that number. <laughs> important important data uh, that, that the capitalists are willing to just admit. That's fine. Um, so this is all really insidious, and it sounds, I think, kind of hard to believe. It's a, it's a wild story for sure. But it did actually happen, and there are many accounts of these people. Um, you can go read about them in uh, this Keith Bolander book or elsewhere. Um, all kinds of interesting figures in the uh, United States pop culture, I guess, uh, or somehow in, in – um, like – are, uh, you know, their stories are concurrent with this. Like uh, Jeff Bezos' dad Mm -hmm. is one of these people, which is bizarre. Um, Okay, Uh, maybe a a few more details about though that are kind of interesting. So Father Father O'Walsh, he was the head of the Catholic Welfare Bureau um, in uh, the Miami Diocese uh, in the Catholic Church, right? So he is this person who is there to kind of coordinate the visas and kind of like arrange care on, on the United States side, though that care is not always there um some of the children were like shipped overseas and some of them you know it's just it's just like trafficking children is a, is a messy business i think um and uh finding out what to do with them is even messier i guess is what, Fourteen thousand kids in two years is pretty wild a lot yeah it's significant right so this is a quote from uh keith bolander's book this is a different one than the one that dean mentioned a minute ago but this is called voices from the other side an oral history of terrorism against cuba so Bolander writes, it was decided that the plan to arrange exit visas under Walsh's direction would be co- would be coordinated through the State Department, and a system was set up that offered funds to the Catholic Welfare Bureau for every Cuban brought out, allegedly adding up to millions of dollars. Walsh organized the facilities at his Catholic Welfare Bureau to house Cuban children, as well as arranging locations in foster homes or other locations for those organizations, or other locations for those his organization couldn't handle. So there you go. Um... I think that this story is wild in a lot of different ways, right? I mean, on the one hand, like, um, terrorism is usually, you know, it has a really specific uh, a specific sort of definition, right? It's the creation of a particular type of terror in people so that they won't do X, Y, or Z thing. This is something a little bit different. Um, this is like, you know, tricking a whole lot of parents into being so afraid for their kids that they would literally send them to another country, basically to never see them again. So um, to me, that's bad. Um, not not the usual uh, definition of terrorism, but to me, I think even worse in some ways uh, is the creation of a type of widespread fear and panic among people uh, so that they would literally break their family um, they, rather than, like, leave their kids in Cuba. Uh, morally speaking, awful, corrupt. Um, 
probably uh, some people are going to be doing some time in the big cosmic jail that we call hell for it. I, I don't know. <laughs> Purgatory, man. at least. It's just like, yeah, it is so cartoonishly evil to steal kids from people, but that is exactly what the United States did. And uh, that's that's uh, that's number two on this list. <laughs> Yeah, number two in no hierarchy or no discernible order. Probably we should have thought about that part harder, but guess what we didn't. Yeah, this is this is not a, a listicle where the end is like the the height. This is, might be one of the worst. Yeah, it probably is actually. Well, no, there's one one other one that's comparable. There's one that's worse. Bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's not the next one. We're gonna uh, the way we've got it organized here. I think is a uh, you know <laughs> varying degrees of intensity. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. We're giving you the story of Alan Gross. What a what a sad situation for this uh, <laughs> this poor internet guy. Operation Peter Pan, huge bummer. Um, here is, I think, one of my favorite stories, just because it is so weird and so recent. Uh, so again, I was saying, you know, you might think all this kind of U.S. intervention with Cuba is, is back in the past, right? Um, the U.S. surely can't get away with doing these things anymore. Guess what? You would be wrong. Um, in 2014, it came to light that there was an extremely weird plot by the U.S. government to create its own social media uh, account or a social media platform in Cuba in order to kind of seed it and foment uh, resistance. So the platform was called Zun, Zun Zuneo. And there's a Guardian article that is super in-depth that you can read called U.S. Secretly Created Cuban Twitter to Stir Unrest and Undermine Government. (laughs) Uh, Man, it is so funny and so weird. So I'm going to read kind of a a little bit from it, and uh, then we can talk about it some more. Uh, But it, it is so fascinating. All right. In July 2010. Joe McSpeeden, a U.S. government official, flew to Barcelona to put the final touches on a secret plan to build a social media project aimed at undermining Cuba's communist government. McSpeeden and his team of high-tech contractors had come in from Costa Rica and Nicaragua, Washington and Denver, their mission to launch a messaging network that could reach hundreds of thousands of Cubans. To hide the network from the Cuban government, they would set up a Byzantine system of front companies using a Cayman Islands bank account and recruit unsuspecting executives who would not be told of the company's ties to the U.S. government. McSpeeden didn't work for the CIA. This was a program paid for and run by the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, best known for overseeing billions of dollars in U.S. humanitarian aid. So you can already see some links to the uh, <laughs> the wild plot that uh, Alan Gross was pulled into, right? They're sort of finding these people who don't quite know what's going on, roping them in. According to documents obtained by the Associated Press and multiple interviews with people involved in the project, the plan was to develop a bare-bones Cuban Twitter using cell phone text messaging to evade Cuba's strict control of information. In a play on Twitter, it was called Zonzonea, which is slang for a Cuban Cuban hummingbird's tweet. Documents show the U.S. government planned to build a subscriber base through non-controversial content, news messages on soccer, music, and hurricane updates, Later, when the network reached a critical mass of subscribers, perhaps hundreds of thousands, operators would introduce political content aimed at inspiring Cubans to organize smart mobs, mass gatherings called at a moment's notice that might trigger a Cuban spring, or as one USA document put it, renegotiate the balance of power between the state and society. At its peak, the project drew in more than 40,000 Cubans to share news and exchange opinions, but its subscribers were never aware it was created by the U.S. government or that American contractors were gathering their private data in the hope that it might be useful for political purposes. Quote, there will be absolutely no mention of United States government involvement, according to a 2010 memo from Mobile Accord, one of the project's contractors. This is absolutely crucial for the long-term success of the service and to ensure the success of the mission. So there's lots more in the article. They tell a pretty in-depth story about who's involved, what are the players, and so on, and they talk about how it kind of collapses. Um, but it is an extremely weird idea <laughs> that someone at USAID had and then did fund to create an entirely new Twitter in order to uh, do sort of uh, flash mobs against the Cuban government in Cuba. It's incredible. you got to think, too, that the... <laughs> I don't know. So, so much wild stuff is going on, on Twitter nowadays. Um, it's got to be a psyop too, right? It's like <laughs> it's got to be in the mix. That was where they they uh, USA they they launched Twitter in the United States, and they got us all kind of hooked. 
on uh, the weirdest stuff, and uh, then they decide they're going to uh, further their success and uh, and launch it in Cuba too. It's true. They've got me. <laughs> That's right. It's such a wild example, though. Um, well, I mean, it's wild because it, it actually happened, right? There were there were there were real users to it. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know, just a very funny plan. Uh, at first, it's just soccer news, then all of a sudden, it'll be organize a smart mob <laughs> take out <laughs> take out fidel yeah what's really interesting about it is the guardian article basically says that uh usaid um like they say the program ended when the money ran out and they don't give any kind of reason as to why or what's going on just the funding dried up which they do talk about some logistical issues uh one funny thing is that the program was becoming successful enough that the people running it were like, we actually don't have the capacity to run our own Twitter. <laughs> like <laughs> doing Twitter is kind of a big deal. Um, and Zonzaneo just wasn't going to be able to pull it off. So 40,000 users was a lot to manage. Um, so maybe it is true. Maybe it just got too big for its britches or something. But uh, yeah, hard to say exactly why, except that the money did run out. It did go away. Um, but I think it's really telling because so this article came out in 2014. The story is sort of around 2010 and, and on. Uh, but, you know, as soon as even like the uh, the July 11 movement last year in the streets, there was all kinds of fishy stuff with Twitter in particular. Um, lots of kind of basically fake news and false uh, information campaigns going on. And I mean, it all sort of suggests, I guess, that <laughs> these kinds of strategies are not gone away. And it's also wild that this happened under Barack Obama, like while Obama yeah. was starting to think about thawing relations and so on. Um, they're also doing this very weird project to uh, <laughs> create a fake Twitter in Cuba. Yeah, there's like so much entropy, you know, in the state, uh, especially with these like extremely long held and stupid <laughs> <laughs> grudges. So, I mean, Obama or not thawing or not, I guess it's still. Uh... Still soft power all the time. <laughs> That's right. So, so far the, uh, the trend has been like soft power, hard power. So now, um, we're back to uh, hard power again. We're switching back and forth. Who's <laughs> listicle. Um, so this example is a little bit harder to confirm like 100%. Um, uh, the Keith Bolden book, it, um, it talks about, uh, this chapter in terms of like a murder scene. So, this is a murder scene um, where you have lots of circumstantial evidence, but not hard evidence. Um, you know, you have uh, the person who did it, where they did it, um, but not like the murder weapon or something, <laughs> maybe to, to stretch the analogy a bit, right? So um, that being the case, uh, what I'm about to say might not be 100% true. It might be even less than 100% true, but I think there's a case to be made that there's a, a very suspicious thing happening here. Okay. So there's a, a chapter in this Keith Bolden book that tells these stories of um, the um, like troubling history of mysterious diseases uh, in people, plants, and animals in Cuba um, from the 1970s on. Um, so the suspicion is by many people in Cuba, at least some of the governmental officials and even some people outside Cuba, is that these like suspicious outbreaks of diseases were actually the product of U.S. covert operations, um, introducing chemical warfare in one way or another, biological weapons, basically. Um, so anyways, can't say if it's true 100%, don't know. Um, but there's a case to be made, and at least some people suggest that that might be the case. I'm hedging my bets here, folks, <laughs> and uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to read a bit here from this Keith Bolander book. And, uh, and you know what? In the end, you can be the judge. All right. In January 1977, Newsday, followed by the Washington Post, Le Monde, and The Guardian, and others published interviews with a former CIA agent who confessed that he was part of the operation to introduce swine fever to Cuba in the early 1970s. The agent, not named, but suspected to be, but suspected to be Philip Agee, claimed the fever was introduced from the Guantanamo Naval Base at the southern end of Cuba. Evidence was also presented at Fort Gluick in Panama. A CIA agent handed over a vial of biological microorganisms to pass on to Cuban-American groups with the intent to introduce them to Cuba. Okay, so this is, like I said, like loose evidence. This is based on the, um, you know, like the testimony of someone who they think is a CIA agent and, and all that kind of stuff, right? And 
um, it is suspicious. It's weird, and it's hard for me to say and like judge like one way or the other. But um, this is not the only story like it, I guess, which which makes me extra suspicious. So this <laughs> happened in the seventies, um, and like I said, you know, there's there's a there's a history of the CIA, you know, using um, Cuban American exiles who are um, pretty unhappy about the revolution, to say the very least, to carry out their dirty work, right? And this is maybe one of those cases. Um, there are all kinds of these, like, like anti- or counter-revolutionary groups in Miami um, after the Cuban Revolution, and the, and the CIA was, like, uh, deeply involved in training them and sometimes arming them, and sometimes completely ignoring them and distancing themselves from them when, when it was convenient. Um so anyways, this this might be one of those cases. Okay, but like I said, there there are more examples that I think um, that kind of tell us more. Um, so this is later. This is in the, in the 1980s. Um, this is another example maybe of possible bio- biological warfare. Luis Perez Vincent, uh, who is the director of Exotic Disease, Quarantine, Plants, and Pests in Cuba, spoke of the most devastating case of biological terrorism inflicted upon Cuba. This is a quote from uh, Vincent. Hemorrhagic dengue 2 was not found in other parts of the Caribbean when Cuba was affected by this epidemic in 1981, nor were there any cases in Cuba at the time. There's virtually no way it could have been brought into Cuba accidentally or naturally. It appeared in Cuba in an unusual form in three different parts of the country at the same time. The three areas are Havana, Cienfuegos, and Camagüey. Um, They lie hundreds of miles apart, although there's a straight line from one side of the island to the other. So this is an important story um, because I think about how bizarre the emergence of uh, of dengue two. I, I'm not an epidemiologist. I obviously don't know anything about this, but you know this dude who uh, who does this for a living might know something about it. <laughs> the interesting thing that they lay out in this um, in this chapter a little bit later on is that um, part of the suspicion is that is that the the fever, especially dengue specifically here, it all kind of popped up at the same time in the same places at the same intensity, right? So, like, it it appeared sort of, like, in this more evolved form than it would have if it were just, like, introduced accidentally or something and had to, like, you know, evolve in, in strains, like, you know, like we saw with COVID or something. So that's the suspicion. Um, All right, so further here, Luis Perez, the same guy, he continued that once dengue hit, there were interchanges and lectures among experts. We spoke to scientists from other parts of the world, and there was a tremendous exchange of information. The first stages of the operational mode were to study the event, to study the spread of the disease. Once it was determined it was dengue 2, uh, to gain information as how the disease affected people and how to treat it. Then we put into context to what happened before, aspects such as determining the CIA had special interest in these matters. As well, this is unrelated to dengue. In 1982, the Cuban government knew the CIA had asked one of our double agents, great spycraft stuff here, <laughs> Um, asked one of our double agents what information there was of any problems regarding uh, agriculture in Cuba and specifically talked about two biological agents. Uh, A little time after, we detected an epidemic of a bird disease in Santiago and Baracoa. It had never been in that area before, so there is a connection directly between the introduction and the event. The investigation of this bird disease was conducted by one of the most famous Cuban scientists, Oscar Viamontes Becerra, um, he's a PhD biologist, I guess, a famous person. I don't really know him, so can't speak for that. He was able to isolate the virus, and he discovered that the characteristic of this variation didn't correspond to any variation in nature, so it had it had to be manipulated artificially. It was the worst variant of the virus, affecting all types of birds. For scientists, it's hard to say it's absolute proof of intentional manipulation and introduction, but the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming, and there's a pattern that we can determine. This is the difficulty in all of these studies. It's impossible to say 100% of the diseases. um, It is impossible to say 100% of the diseases were introduced intentionally. But when you look at the evidence in total, it's also impossible not to come to that conclusion. Okay. So once again, even, even the folks in Cuba are sort of suspicious. They don't really know what to make of it in, in, you know, in a complete manner, but they are suspicious and probably rightfully so. Um, there's a, there's a few more examples of this throughout this chapter from Keith Bolander's book, and they're all, I think, pretty interesting. Um, there's also this uh, whole big section um, about the introduction of this particular type of blue mold on tobacco that was never a problem in Cuba before uh, this particular time period in the 80s. Um, and then suddenly it was, right? So I think that that's kind of part of the, sus- the suspicion, too, is that um, 
there are all these diseases that were all of a sudden a problem that had never been a problem before. I think it's interesting uh, just that, you know, maybe there's no smoking gun or something, but um, germ and biological warfare was talked about already as a strategy for intervening in Cuba during the JFK administration. So it's not like the CIA and U.S. government weren't thinking about it, at least, and sort of, you know, right. putting forward plans and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying, uh, <laughs> you know, not saying it did or didn't happen or whatever, but I am saying that, like, the U.S. government actively entertained that, and you can at least, uh, you know, <laughs> that part is true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's definitely not beyond the pale or anything like that. Okay, I want to give one more story because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, and <laughs> I don't know, just one more thing to kind of coordinate or triangulate the truth in the matter, maybe. Okay, so this is once again from Keith Bolander's book. Eduardo Aracena, a Cuban-American connected to Miami-based anti-revolutionary group Omega-7, confessed in 1984 that he had visited Cuba in 1980 in connection with a mission to introduce, quote, some germs into the country. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. As reported by the New York Times, Aracena's testimony came during his trial in New York for his connection to the assassination of Cuban diplomat Felix Garcia in front of the United Nations building in 1980, and with other bombings in the United States against Cuban interests. Um, this is another one of those examples, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, though, of, of where the CIA would, like, train and sometimes arm and fund um, these, like, anti-revolutionary groups and then, like, distance themselves from them when they got kind of, like, unwieldy or out of hand. Um, so at his trial, he testified, the mission of the group was to obtain certain germs, introduce them to Cuba, to start a chemical war in Cuba. This is that, that's his testimony. One of those was Dengue 2. Um, so there's another incident in October 1996 when a Cuban Fokker, which is an F-27 airplane. I didn't know that, but great to know. <laughs> an F-27 airplane was flying from Havana to Holguin above the International Air Corridor, observed above him a small plane with American markings flying north. At this moment, the Cuban pilot, Arian Romero Lewis, um, observed a spray of smoke coming from the American plane, which he reported to the control tower. He also contacted directly the American plane and asked if there was any problem, and the pilot responded, no. I have seen the report from the Cubana aviation officials and the dialogue between the pilots. Um, that's Keith Bolander saying that. This is a quote again from um, the, the report. A month later, the area below where the plane flew, farmers reported the plague, Thrips palmy, which affects various vegetable products. This was during the special period when the government was experimenting with various forms of increased food production, including, uh, like, agroponics. So, um, again, like, no smoking gun, just kind of like some interesting pieces of the puzzle that people are piecing together here. Um, but, you know, pretty suspicious, if you say the very <laughs> least. Um, definitely not beyond the pale, uh, not something that's impossible. Um and uh, interesting, though, I mean, I think that the, the interesting thing here to me is even that, like, these groups of the CIA would bolster uh, through training or whatever, sometimes kind of came back to bite them in the butt mm -hmm. in an interesting way and, like, kind of speak out out of turn, <laughs> which is probably not what they wanted, but um, but interesting to say the least. So there are all these stories uh, throughout this chapter in uh, Keith Bolander's book uh, about possible cases of biological warfare where this could have happened. and. I don't know. Um, not sure what to make of it 100%, but I think there's a, an interesting case to be made. Yeah, well, there's also a strange irony, too, because during the Bush administration, the um, John Bolton in particular, you might remember him from the Trump administration, uh, during the Bush years, he had a whole campaign about how Cuba was creating germ warfare and had like a lab growing it and so on. And uh, they were going to tie it all to the war on terror in a big way. And eventually they had to back off of it because it turned out that it was not provable at all. And even the Republicans couldn't uh, <laughs> couldn't maintain that Cuba had like a lab for bioweapons. But the right. you know, <laughs> it's also one of those things where uh, how bizarre is it that the U.S. often accuses other countries of things that it has like actively at least thought about <laughs> pursuing. Um, yeah. So anyway, lots of weird stuff going on there. Um. All right, let's go to our last item and uh, a uh, uh, we're ending on a, on a soft power note just so it doesn't feel so intense. Um, it is talking a little bit about evangelicals and what's going on with them and how they relate to U.S. efforts for uh, destabilization and kind of exercising that soft power in Cuba. So 
evangelicalism has often been kind of the tip of the spear for U.S. interests in Latin America generally, and Cuba is no different. That's not a uh, completely fair generalization. Evangelicalism, as we've learned on this podcast, is a variable thing in Latin America in a way that's way more plastic and open to progressive yeah. kind of uh, formulations in ways that it just does not seem to be in the United States, <laughs> in my experience. Um, so it's it's not like every evangelical is, uh, you know, the the vanguard of imperialism. But the U.S. has actively promoted evangelicalism all over Latin America as a direct counterpoint to liberation theology and also as kind of a way to introduce another human rights problem in that they can kind of boost, you know, as we saw in the report that we read last week. So as people probably know, and as we've talked about on the show a couple of times, Cuba recently had a vote on the amendment to the family code in Cuba that created stronger rights and freedoms for LGBTQ people in Cuba um, including parental rights and lots of other kinds of things. So it was a huge sweeping undertaking. Uh, they passed that this year. It was supposed to be passed in 2019. And that's when the Constitution had been amended in a big way since the 1970s. And at that time, the government decided that they were going to kick it down the road to a separate vote so that the vote on the family code and the vote on the Constitution wouldn't sort of like create a problem where the Constitution didn't pass because of that particular issue. So uh, the reason they kicked it down the road is because there was a huge evangelical and other Christian, like the, the Catholic Church, other Christian sort of backlash against the family code. And learning more about where that kind of backlash comes from and how it gets used is, I think, a very instructive thing for Christians in particular. So uh, just to sort of tell a little bit of a, a story here, um, in 2019, there was a, a big sort of, um, you know, dust up around all this stuff. What's going to happen? Is Cuba going to finally make progress on LGBT issues or not? And one interesting thing that you get in kind of USAID or U.S. Uh, State Department sort of human rights discourse is, on the one hand, they will chastise Cuba for being uh, behind on LGBTQ rights, which is a bit bizarre because it's way more complicated in Cuba than they say. Um, and secondly, they will say religious freedoms are under attack in Cuba. So it's these, these two issues that the U S government is apparently very nervous about. Uh, however, the U S actual interests pit these things against each other and create a contradiction in Cuban society, for example, in 2019. So, uh, I'll give just one sort of concrete connection here. Uh, there was an article in the Associated Press in 2021 talking about some of the fallout from all this stuff uh, leading up to the Family Code. So the AP article is called In Cuba, Divisions Over Law to Allow Same-Sex Marriage. Um, there's a lot of kind of comments within the article about how people in Cuba are talking about it. But in particular, I want to pull out this one. The article says the idea uh, bothers, the idea of same-sex marriage, bothers the Reverend Moises de Prada who, like many of his parishioners, opposes a proposal to legalize same-sex marriage in Cuba. Quote, it's not going to bring any benefit, said De Prada, general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, which have grown rapidly in Cuba and now claim more than 2,000 churches and 1 million members. Quote, the family conceived as it is structured in the word of God is that which is agreed between a man and a woman and the resulting children. Uh, you've heard it all before, pretty standard boilerplate stuff. Uh, in 2019, there was a very funny article in Christian Post called Cuba Bars Evangelicals from Attending U.S. Religious Freedom Ministerial. And in that article, they say the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. That's right. You scurf <laughs> the same group that we read this wild report from last week. They reported that Moises de Prada, the president of the Assemblies of God, and a handful of other pastors were stopped by government officials before they were able to board planes bound for the U.S. in July. All the leaders were invited to take part in the U.S. State Department's second global summit addressing the issue of international religious freedom, which was touted as being the largest religious freedom summit ever held. Christian Solidarity Worldwide notes that Prada and this other pastor are founding members of the newly established Cuban Evangelical Alliance, a coalition of seven denominations created in defense of biblical values. 
After the denominations expressed concern, they did not feel represented by the Cuban Council of Churches. Uh, the Cuban Council of Churches actively was for the passing of the, the Family Code Amendment. And as we have learned from uh, Jim Hodgson and others, there's these kind of stronger divisions that are being made more, more prominent in Cuban society. Um, but it's a really kind of interesting moment here because uh, on the one hand, this guy, De Prada, this particular pastor is like actively trying to organize a potentially huge section of the Cuban populace against LGBTQ uh, rights in that country. And at the same time, the Cuban government or the U.S. government is also very nervous that this particular pastor is being sort of prevented from going to a U.S. conference <laughs> about religious freedom. <laughs> um, and I mean, the dots are not that hard to connect, right? The U.S. has an interest in a person like De Prada. I mean, he is a homophobic pastor, but they are able to sort of use him as an example of people whose religious freedoms are being trampled. Um, because his religious freedom is really the freedom to stir the pot around uh, homophobic legislation in Cuba. And man, there are so many examples like this of USAID or US uh, CIRF directly sort of like weaponizing uh, reactionary or conservative Christianity in Cuba in order to tell a very specific story about the Cuban government and to try to sort of weasel their way into a civil society sector that you know, just like Zunzuneo might have some kind of uh, uh, flash mob capacity or kind of, you know, make it seem like the U.S. government's interests are at an arm's length and that this is sort of an indigenous Cuban issue. Um, there's another example we can talk about in a moment, but I'll pause there because I think the, the De Prada stuff, it's like you sort of have to dig around for it, but the, the links are pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, it's so frustrating because, uh, I mean, it's so frustrating because in the United States, um you know, there are protections for LGBTQ people um, and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it, it's great for us, right? It's great for us in the United States. But in Cuba, we can, they, they're willing to promote um, homophobic pastors just to, just to stir the pot, right? It's just such a, um, a, a gross instrument. It's such a gross instrumentationalization of people. Um, and I, I guess it really shows you, like, where uh you know the state's values lie not with people whatsoever just kind of with like uh their own sort of plots to uh overthrow a, a small island nation 90 miles off the shore of, <laughs> yes. of florida exactly. for whatever reason you know exactly uh so just to pull out one other example um because i think there is probably a very interesting research project somewhere in here that i don't have time to do but maybe someone else does um, there's a lot of examples of USAID and other kind of money going to um, Christian dissidents in Cuba, which is to say, uh, you know, Christian people who oppose that that progressive kind of turn. And uh, actually, maybe Matt, maybe you should introduce the this particular example because uh, we've both been looking at it for a while. Um, <laughs> do you want to take a stab at introducing people to uh, Teo Babin? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll do. I'll do my best. Um, okay, Teo Babin is like the guy behind this thing called Echo Cuba. Um, Echo Cuba stands for Evangelical Christian Humanitarian Outreach for Cuba. And um, <laughs> for some very funny reason, um, maybe two years ago, I did add him on LinkedIn and he added me back. So we're connected there. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to get in there. I'm going to start salting his employees. And uh, no, just kidding. Not going to do anything like that, but just very silly. So... Um, Let's see. Here's here's a good place to start. So in um, in 2019, uh, Vice published an article called How American Evangelicals Help Stop Same-Sex Marriage in Cuba. Um, I'm going to read a few pieces from this article, and then we'll talk about who Teo Babin is and what's going on here. <laughs> okay. So recently, journalist Tracy Eaton's Cuba Money Project published a list of Cuba-related projects that have received the most government funding since Trump took office. This, you know, again, 2019. Number five on the list, they're also doing a listicle, and I can appreciate that. <laughs> Number five on the list is Evangelical Christian Humanitarian Outreach for Cuba, or Echo Cuba, with just over $1 million. This group received roughly $2.3 million from the U.S. government from 2009 to 2017. So even during the Obama years, uh, they, got some, they got some hot cash. Echo Cuba leads missionary trips to Cuba, provides resources and training to Cuban churches, and fights biblical poverty on the island. Okay. 
<laughs> but the group may not only be exporting religious ideology. Its founder, Miami-based Teo Bauman, comes from a family of Cuban exiles, and according to an article published in Granma, Cuba's state newspaper, supported the anti-communist Bay of Pigs invasion in 1971. This is a quote. Um, as a good mercenary, Teo Bauman today has extended his activity via a few Protestant denominations, reads the Granma article, which complement Trump's goals outlined in June of 2018 to perfect the subversive U.S. policy toward Cuba and the manipulation of Protestant denominations with a view toward a transition in Cuba. So that last quote there is from Granma. So it's like, you know, clearly has some spice on it <laughs> about Teo Bauman. <laughs> but another great example, though, of the ways that the United States, even during the, you know, the progressive Obama years, um, was totally willing to just like shovel over a bunch of money to some dude to promote, um, you know, homophobic ideologies in Cuba. Um, it is frustrating. It is bad. It's another example of that soft power, I think, at play for sure. Um, I don't know, Dean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree. <laughs> I think it is bad. Um, I think it's really interesting, though, because it sort of shows the the institutionalization of some of that soft power and the way that Christianity right. functions in it, that um, it's not like USAID is such a wild organization because it's not like you see a USAID staff person going to Cuba and doing all this stuff. Instead, they've kind of learned that you have to be a little sneaky about it, right? Uh, you convince um, you convince a computer guy to go install a bunch of stuff and hope for the best, or you convince a handful of like social media tech entrepreneurs that they should develop a new app, or you convince uh, I don't know. You don't really have to convince Teo Babin, but you find a Teo Babin <laughs> that you can sort of right. get to do something instead of you doing it as USA directly, right? And I think, uh, especially when it comes to Christianity, it's just important to figure out that Christianity is being actively weaponized against the people of Cuba. And the media, when it reports on religion in Cuba or many other issues where religion comes up, it really doesn't know how to talk about it or it has sort of short term memory. So, for example, like during the July 11 protests, there were all kinds of articles left and right about Christians being persecuted by the Cuban state in that moment and pastors were jailed and arrested and so on. And, you know, I'm not saying that like there was probably, you know, nothing bad done by the Cuban state in response to those protests. It was a complicated situation, but uh, what you don't get in that story is like, who are the pastors being jailed uh, for what purpose? What is their kind of longer history in Cuba? Right. Um, <laughs> is it like, a, uh, a de Prada who has been known to be stirring the pot already and looking for opportunities to destabilize the government? Um, is it a, an evangelical group that's directly working with the, the USAID folks to, you know, figure out, I don't know, other ways of kind of renegotiating the balance between state and society or however they put it, right? Like, these are things that most reporters just like don't have an ear for. Um, it's one reason that I really wanted to write that article for Sojourners about uh, the MLK Center and the student Christian movement and how they contributed to the family code, because there's also, you know, a group of real Christians, uh, not fake ones, <laughs> as the 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 Oskar calls them, uh, trying to figure out what is a, a Christian role in revolutionary society? Is there a way to sort of deepen the revolution, push it in a more progressive direction with that voice, Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the way that we talk about it sort of reduces everything to like people are being persecuted for their religion. And, uh, I think that's untrue, right? Cuba has like good reason to see religion as a political force. And unfortunately, sadly, like good reason to be suspicious of it as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, for what it's worth, this is just a complete aside, but Teo Bobbin, uh, the grandma article says that uh, his family was the owner of the biggest sawmill in Cuba before the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> it's always them, huh? <laughs> it's always somebody like that. <laughs> but like you were saying, Dean, you're right. Like, you know, um, does the Cuban state do everything right? No, of course not. But like also, um, <laughs> does the United States weaponize religion to like stir the pot and sow discontent? Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um and uh, I think you're right, though. I mean, there there is, like, a pretty rich tradition in Cuba, though, of, like, real actual Christians who are real and not fake, um, whose voices deserve to be heard. And, like, that is an important, like, vector in the story that uh, no one's picking up on but us, specifically. <laughs> right. The hard-hitting journalism over here. Um, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You know, I think what frustrates me about it, especially, too, is... Um, 
you'll see USAID tweet something or put out a blog post or a report where they're like, USAID is happy to support LGBTQ plus activists all around the world who are, yeah. you know, advocating for, for their, the full enjoyment of human rights. And it's like, meanwhile, in Cuba, they're pouring millions of dollars into homophobic opposition to changing the family code. And yep. I think it's important that we understand those contradictions as well, that U.S. imperialism does not care about human rights. Uh, it cares about weaponizing human rights in the interest of U.S. capital. It is like as bald and plain as that. I think there are probably some kind of naive people who work at USAID who think they're making the world a better place. But, you know, with the example of Cuba is so clear and obvious that way. Um, maybe another example, uh, just to draw out another connection um, between this kind of Christian and, and USAID thing. Uh, in Venezuela, uh, there was a big story several years ago, I think in 2019 or 18, I forget exactly when, but um, it, there was a huge crisis happening. I mean, still, but there was a big crisis. And the big headline was the Maduro government will not allow foreign aid into the country. And right. that headline was because USAID was not allowed specifically into the yeah. country. And what's wild is uh, Caritas Venezuela, which is part of the, you know, the biggest um, Catholic aid organization in the world, uh, Federation of Organizations. Caritas Venezuela said, please don't say that there's no foreign aid coming into Venezuela because there is aid coming in through Caritas. And actually, we need it. <laughs> like, if you tell people that, you know, the aid's not getting here, they won't give and then we won't have the aid to distribute. Uh, but for USAID's purposes, it was a great sort of political opportunity, right, to castigate the Maduro government and uh, outright, outright lie about that situation. And so the irony is like, Caritas Venezuela is not a like radical left Chavista organization, right? Um, but they're trying to say, look, uh, we're we're working as Christians to figure out what our place is in this complicated situation, and uh, nevertheless, USA is not doing them any favors, right? It's it's pursuing a different agenda. So, you know, the the story we tell about religion as it relates to imperialism. Uh, with respect to socialist kind of experiments, I think is really complicated and something we have to uh, have <laughs> and we have to cultivate like long term memories around in a big way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, there's enough uh, weird USAID, United States propaganda to uh, keep it very complicated for us. Though, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorting out is tough. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. The top five <laughs> in no particular order examples of u.s meddling in cuba that we have just been thinking about that are kind of off the beaten path i think you know we were like maybe we'll do an episode on something like the bay pigs or operation mongoose or whatever but those are pretty uh common knowledge things or things that you can find lots of resources on yourself but uh, i think it's good to recognize there are these kind of high points right uh, operation peter pan um, potential bio weapons and so on. Uh, but there are also these really recent kind of moments too, where you, the U S government is trying to be perversely creative. They're, they're disrupting the imperialism space. They're thinking of new innovative ways <laughs> to, uh, to Uberize regime change. And, uh, I think it's bad. And I think Christians in particular have to be vigilant about that because we're getting drawn into it, whether we like it or not. I think that's true. And also, you know, the other, the other part of the, the puzzle here is that, um, the United States like holds a blockade against the Cuban people based on, you know, these narratives that Cuba is a, is a state sponsor of terrorism, um, which is egregious given mm -hmm. the case that the United States is literally... <laughs> Is literally carrying out terrorist acts against Cuba, so I, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, it's just—I mean, you know, that's just a bald-faced lie, right? I mean, the the, the blockade is a, completely a fabrication. I mean, the the justification for it is a complete fabrication. Mm -hmm. um, so um, frustrating, stupid, and uh, but and yet here we are. And yet here we are. So go down to your local U.S. consulate if you're outside the U.S. Uh, go write a letter to your congressperson or house representative or whoever <laughs> is around and uh, say this blockade is bad and the U.S. should quit meddling in Cuba and we should just let Cuba determine its own fate. That's our big uh, advent task. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Also, you can go get our Cubazine at bit.ly slash Cubazine. Download it and show it to your friends. Show it to your 
my, it printed out and put it in someone's stocking. I guess mm-hmm. is what I could say. Um, our intro music is by Amaria Armstrong. Our outro music is by The Illogical Spoon. And we'll see you next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up and you stay up late in Jackson. You keep your hoods up, well you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early. Besides, what else?